Hello everybody, I'm Kate Fogger and with me is Julie Hurt and together we, I'm just putting eyes up, uh, together we are making like two humans being, two humans being, you'd think I'd know this by now, two humans being. So today we're going to talk about, um, shall we say all things animal because there's, right, there's a lot going on um, and I've been talking to Julie about it and um, I think there's some very interesting topics in there, Julie. Um, we shall see. We'll see how it evolves. So what has started this conversation is, of course, my very sweet, well, all, all animals are sweet, aren't they? My very sweet friend, Nyla. I have three hens, uh, ex-battery hens, which means they are... Um, you have the concept of battery hens? Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yeah. Um, so we've actually had them since 2017, which means we've had them six years which means they are about seven and a half to eight years old, which is uh, great, great, great granny in terms of battery hens. I think the average life expectancy of ex-battery hens is about four years, if that. Um, a lot of them die within a few months, within a few weeks of being rehomed. Uh, we did. We had five. We lost one. She lasted six months, which is not bad. Um, and then she just shut down. It was very sad. And then we lost another one about a year later. That was also very sad. Dora. Dora, the explorer, the first one. Oh, don't start me about my chickens and lovely little Wambas. Wambas was Nyla's best buddy. And they really were buddies. It was quite sweet to see. Um, and I've always felt quite sad, actually, that although my three rumble along together, none of them have that relationship that Nyla and Wambas does because it did because it makes you realize that hens like every other animal in the world they all have favorites you know they all have preferences that you don't I remember when I moved here the farmer told me that sheep had chums like and they would get distressed if they were separated and I remember thinking oh like it just hadn't occurred to me of course now it seems obvious all animals of course have preferences also remember sorry talking too much but I remember seeing this thing it was Chester Zoo I think and there was a, some exotic stick insect or a frog or something and they were scoured the earth for a mate for it and brought it and they just well had nothing to do with each other and it makes you realize that even stick insects say well he may be the last man on earth but he's not for me it's like I thought that was hilarious so um, so as I ponder what to do with Nyla, because what's happened is that she has, presumably she has a tumour, she has a bacterial infection that I have tried, we've tried several um, medications, it's not going, and I've drawn the line um, because it's just, it's too distressing and it's not helping. And she did tell me right from the start that it wouldn't make any difference. So the belief is there is an underlying tumour, but it's starting to affect her facially. So there's so many issues in here. But it, one of the things that came up for me is 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 about euthanasia. When, how, what? And I thought that might be um, a very difficult, but also a very um, useful subject to discuss. And I think, from my perspective, you know, we we say, well, as long as they have quality of life, we'll keep them alive. The first thing I want to say, though, was that we are taught, and I believe, and from my experience, is that animals do consider euthanasia as part of their way of leaving because we learn in soul level animal communication and all our experiences that animals actually plan their death very detailed in fact why don't you talk about that side of it julie since i've really rambled on far too much about what your experience of animals and their death is yeah in so, terms of pets, shall we say so what sorry in terms of pets because i don't know with our wild animals aren't necessarily geared around people though in some cases they will be yeah um yeah, there's even stuff in there about wild animals. So my experience with with pets in particular um, in doing this animal communication work that we do, um, you're right. It has always, every single reading, if it's about an animal preparing to cross the Rainbow Bridge or has crossed the Rainbow Bridge, um, they always, so far, every single one of them, has said this is how it was supposed to be and given the their owner a reason why. Um, if the animal escaped, got hit by a car, there was a reason why. If the animal got cancer and passed or died suddenly in their sleep, there was a reason why. If the animal really wants help, they will actually ask for help um, to cross. And um, it's to, and 
it's my experience and belief that that is what creates this um this is what creates this connection with animals that they are actually asking all of us to have in that when they ask for our help to cross the the rainbow bridge they're asking us to to honor this part of the cycle of life they i mean there can be no more i don't think there's a more intimate act than to allow or help another being cross um, and to leave their physical body, um, to relieve them of suffering, relieve them of pain. I don't think there's any greater thing that gift you can give another being than to provide that for them. As <laughs> I'm sorry. I know. I like my guys that are those two. There's other all my animal, almost all my animals. I'm looking at my at my pictures. I think I've helped so many animals cross. It is not easy and I'm not trying to make light of it at all. It is extreme. And this is with the human part, right? This is, it is extremely difficult to make that decision because we never want to make it at the wrong time. The animals are guiding us, however, mm -hmm. as to when, as to how, and with whom, and where, and then what they want to do, what they would like to have done with their remains, usually as a means to for you to go through the ritual of that transition. They actually, with me, they never use the word death or dying. They never, because for them and for us too, if we were in tune with, um, you know, if we were mediums and worked with human spirits in that regard too, human spirits wouldn't say this either. It is the next chapter. It's the next thing. It's the next incarnation if you will i mean they're not incarnated but that there's not another word but that's not the word death for them means done and never coming back or never being never con ceasing to exist and that's not necessary that's not true as far as they're concerned they continue to exist so yeah that's my little there's a beautiful that. there's an animal communicator i find keep looking her up and losing her again it was on youtube and it was either 80s or 90s judging by the hair and the picture quality um and i think she was called terry stuttbacher or stuttgart or something like that I don't know american and she I'll, I'll try and look her up again i was quite inspired to watch it because it was obviously very unusual it's a lot more usual now for people to talk about these things but she was saying how for an animal it's like shrugging off a coat and I just love that and I tell all my clients that if we're talking about an animal passing because it's just like it's nothing to them yeah. and I was listening to some Abraham stuff and trying to comfort myself which I hadn't actually because I'm not sure it did comfort me um but you know because they have such a wider perspective of life as in we're so focused here on our physical world that this lifetime that we have feels like everything in the world whereas they see this as just a series of life after life after life so they are just not as attached to their physical life that doesn't mean that they don't fight tooth and nail to stay here while, while they're here and and that's the bit I'm at with Nyla is like what is her quality of life and she's one of the I don't think she's necessarily doing this to teach me a lesson but there is always lessons to be learned that she might be I don't know I haven't asked because it's too close but one of them is what is a quality what is quality of life like just because her eyes puffed up and I perceive that she's having difficulty eating she can't pick things up because she can't see that way she can still see um but she can't see over her nose because of the swelling so she pecks and misses and I perceive that as frustration because she's not getting it is it frustration or does she just no longer see it so she doesn't go for it you know, things like that. So but there's a lesson there as well. And obviously for all you watching, I make sure she gets the grapes, right? She's not missing out. It's just, she's not able to forage. How much of her life is foraging? I don't know. Does it matter if she's getting the food? Does it matter that she can't scrap? Does she get frustrated? Probably not. She's an animal. She probably just goes, oh, I thought I saw something and now it's not there because she can see it. And then when she looks to focus, she obviously, she can't see it. Um, She's got very good at eating out of her I have this vase I made at a pottery cloth like that but and I've put it inside a saucepan to make it look like a stupid contraption okay it's like what's this because there's a saucepan with lots of brown paper in it to keep it upright like that so it can't fall over and I put her snacks in that she's she's okay eating out the feeder 
Um, but she's now learning to go and look there, regardless of whether she can see or not, she'll put her face in and see what's in there. So it didn't take a long to pick that up. It's possible she will adapt. There are birds, to be fair, they've evolved that way, that can't see down there, and they look and memorise and, and then peck. So, you know, it's possible she'll adapt. But it's like, what is, A, what is quality of life? You know, yeah. what is quality of life for an animal? And then B, my distress in seeing her is because she doesn't look the same. Her face is a bit swollen, her eyes starting to close. You know, it's like there's a lesson in there as well. It's like, it doesn't matter if she's happy. It doesn't matter what her face looks like. Yeah. And I've thought about all the times I've seen people with like old dogs have massive growths on them. And you think, what are you doing keeping them alive? And you think, well, now I'm in a situation where like Gary came in, he hadn't realised how bad I'd said, about the eyesight, I said, you have to be careful when you give her grapes because she can't see. And he was like, well, she was fine last time. It was literally in the space of two, three days and she couldn't. And he came back in quite upset because he hadn't realised. And he's like, well, and I was like, well, what do we do? Condemn her to death because she can't see? It's like suddenly it's all black and white, isn't it? You're going, oh, I feel really sorry for her because she can't see. And you're like, well, OK, what? So, so we kill her? You know, it's like suddenly it's not, I've been so judgmental in the past about about what is suffering and what is right and what is wrong, whether it's, a, you know, so this is a lesson for me because I've seen people with distorted animals and wondered why on earth they've been allowed to continue. And now I realise because, well, what else are you going to do? You're going to put them down because they've got a, a large growth that maybe is a bit uncomfortable and bring around with it. But if the animal's not in pain, right. you know, you, you know, so it's opened up a whole new world of, what is quality of life? We have such strong ideas about what a healthy animal should look like and what an, what anyone should look like and how they should behave and, you know, all, all of that. And now I'm having to rethink all of that about along the very simple lines of, well, is she enjoying it? And like yesterday, it's weather shit here. Um, so I don't really see her, I can't see her wandering around. So I can't really observe her in her natural element, if you like. Um, but I saw her come out of the shed and suddenly kicked out and had a little sunbathe in the 30 seconds of sunshine there was. And I've never seen her do that there. So obviously she's enjoying life because yeah. I just do not believe an animal that's in pain would go and lie in the sun for five minutes. They're usually hiding somewhere. Right. Well, and what is pain? Mm -hmm. You know, that's, there's, when you were talking to the, the I feel like it was a bunch of animals were like pulling little threads. And there's this, this notion of us deeming that another being is suffering, mm -hmm. even though we really don't know. And the flip side of that they're telling me is we can clearly see when other humans and other beings are suffering and we do nothing. So, yeah, yeah, which way it's there, there's the, they're saying like, there's this convenience factor, not that that's what you're doing, you're not at all, but that there can sometimes be this convenience thing instead of this um, seizing of this opportunity to really be integrated with another being who senses the world completely different than we do, I do. I mean, you sense the world differently than I do. Nyla senses the world differently than we do. Lucas, who's at my feet right now, senses the world differently. And it's more the invitation to what is that? What is your experience like? Yeah. Which could really kind of solve a lot of world's problems if we could figure, you know, if we could talk to one yeah, another. Absolutely. Yeah. But this idea of suffering and, I, you know, I as you were talking about, you know, you see a dog that's got this mass and, oh my gosh, he must be, you why, why are you still alive? And and it's, well, we do the same thing to human beings too, that have some type of difference. I don't even want to say, I don't want to say that they won't, the guys won't let me say affliction. They won't let me say disease. They won't let, they're like difference, some kind of difference. And we want to, yeah, agree. Out. it's like, yeah. 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 I, yeah. yeah. I, I used to watch them. It's, I'm quite conflicted about it still. I'm not really sure that, because there was, there was some con. I am I I'm not conflicted about it there is conflict about this program called the undateables in Britain which is about people who struggle to date because they're either because they are um uh, mentally different um or, or have dis different facial disfigurements or or they're very short like physical differences shall we say but over you know 
we're all physically different, but some of them are obviously more pronounced than others in that the rest of us would not deem it normal, you know, beyond, um, and there was some, there was some criticism from people saying, oh, well, you know, it's um, not demonizing them, but extremely patronizing towards these people. But actually I found it a very healthy program from my perspective, because it just opened up again, stuff I hadn't thought about. And it also reflected one of my deepest self beliefs that I am still, it's one of those beliefs that I know I have to get to, I'm not ready to right now. And that is that one has to be beautiful to be loved, mm. you know? And there was a young girl, so there, there are these people and, and they are set up with other people, but you're sort of following it from one person's perspective. But there was what we would deem um, physically normal and quite attractive girl actually who was dating I can't remember I assume it was just some some guy who had either facial disfigurement or something mm. and people had one of the questions asked to her was well how important is to what she looks like what he looks like and she said actually that's never mattered to me and I remember sitting there thinking how can that be true because I in all my um spirituality and all that bollocks still care what people look like right doesn't matter if I'm not going to shag them, then they need to look a certain way. And it's not necessarily the same way that other people need them to look. You know, I'm not saying that I need an Adonis or anything like that. That's that's not my bag. But we still all have preferences. And for someone to say that doesn't it doesn't matter to me was just like, she mm -hmm. must be lying. Mm -hmm. So it's, it's, it's amazing how it just opens up. And then I thought about what would it like to be blind? Like you have a whole different perspective of life if you're not looking at people. And it's just, you know, all these things that open up your mind to how um, conditioned we are. Because I still believe, and a lot of my self-loathing or whatever towards myself is about my size and how I'll ever be attractive. And yes, I can bumble along in my little middle-class, middle-aged life or what middle-aged, middle-aged life because I'm not on show anymore. But if I was suddenly out there again, looking for a partner, I would really struggle with the way that I look and the fact that I'm not thin. And Because I still have that belief, even after all the work I've done, mm -hmm. I still believe that to be loved or to be even more so, to be sexually attractive, one has to look a certain way. And I can't, I still, after all these years, can't really see past that. Mm -hmm. I, how did I get from Nyla to, to <laughs> being on dating sites? <laughs> But so that's it, Nyla. Thank you for flushing all this out for me because there are a lot of ugly truths in there that I still need to examine. Yeah, and I'm actually there. Somebody is bringing up the word like love versus the phrase love versus pity. Like, yes, love is grounding. Love is foundational. Love it like that's how I'm seeing it right now. Love is here, and then pity is this you one thinks one is coming at it from a place of love and caring but really caring but you're really putting all this oh you don't look as everybody else does I feel sorry for you so I'm gonna act like the playing field is level and I'm gonna bring you along that way but I'm doing it because I pity you it's a very different it's a very and different that you yeah. have put the words into what I was looking for is what I look at, Nyla. It's pity. And she's going, I don't need your pity. Yeah. Just just feed me the grapes, but I don't need your pity. Like, yeah. physically help me out here, fine. Make allowances for me, fine. That is exactly it. And that that's what I'm struggling with. I don't want to see her. But that is exactly what, that's what makes me yeah. want to cry, is this pity I feel for her because because she's got a swollen face. I mean, obviously... I'm joking about this flippantly because we have established she is not in pain. As yes. far as I know, there is nothing in her behavior and nothing. And Julie checks her every week and I check her every day. Um, she is not in pain. She's a bit uncomfortable because she's got a swollen face, but she's not in pain. I would not be joking about it. But the point is, she's like, I'm not in pain. I can't see. Just put the grapes in that fucking green contraption you've made. <laughs> but don't. And that's a, that's a law of attraction thing as well about and I can't remember exactly about pity, that it's a really negative thing to bestow on somebody mm -hmm. because you're basically 
saying, you know, it, it, um, the words that come to mind, this is not it, but you'll get the flavor of it, is when you feel sorry for someone and you help them do something, and it's because I see you cannot do it for yourself. It's that sort of attitude of sort of that there is something wrong with you, that you need my pity. And that in itself is a very negative and disempowering energy to bestow on someone. There's a judgment in there. In order to yeah. pity someone, you've deemed them, judged them a certain way. Yes. And therefore, there's a judgment in it. And then there's also a, I want to say like a superiority thing. Like, yes, I absolutely. judge that you can't do this. I, <laughs> can, right? I can help yeah. you. I can do it. I and I can overlook your disability in order to, you know, face doing this. Yeah. I have the entrance ticket to the ball. I will bring you with me. You, you know, there's a whole lot of crap in there. And that's not it's a very ugly energy, isn't it? It's yeah. a very ugly energy. And that's not coming at it from this place of for me, love, which is um, it's a it's a it's a thing for me, it's like a thing to strive for. It's very much a practice to try to get there, but it's not but it it's the seeing the divine light in everything and honoring the divine light for it being the divine light. I see your light. I may not agree with you. I may think you're absolutely nutty. That's all judgment, clearly, right? As long as I can see the divine light, I have something with which to work. We are somehow then compadres, we're equals, we're colleagues, something, something. But at the moment, I'm like, I pity you, or I, I can't see the divine light, but I see something on the shell, then I've lost, I've lost the... The, that's what I, I need to hold on to, really, isn't it? it seeing the, that's what I need to hold on to. Yeah, seeing the divine light, light. Naya. Yeah, and there's a huge trust there as well that 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 she keeps telling me. I will let you know, and this is what I tell, and I know you tell all your clients as well. You will know. You will know when they are no longer enjoying life. Abraham Hicks says that when an animal ceases, when a life ceases to be joyful, they will leave. Like yes. animals, are, that's very comforting. Yes. They don't I need to be useful. Mm -hmm. Sorry. No, I don't need to be useful. <laughs> Sorry. I've had clients. I've had clients where the animal is transitioning. And sometimes the transition can take a year, sometimes longer. It just depends. It depends on what they're working with their human on, on where they're feeling, all the things. And they can say throughout the whole entire transition, I'm going to pass by myself. I'm going to pass by myself. I'm just going to, don't worry, one day you're going to find me because that humans want that relief. And many times they say that so that the human can let go of the transition is coming. They're, they've got it. I don't have to worry about it. They can let go of that, which then allows them to enjoy their time together. This is all the animal doing at this, right? And then as the animal's body begins to fade um, or the transition is stronger or whatever it may be all of the sudden I've had this many times all of a sudden the animal will say in a you know because I will we'll check in every now and then with different animals the animal will say nope now I need help I need help I want it by x date and then they'll be very to some degree they can be really clear about what they want but they will at some point say they want help and the thing is is that the humans usually know this subconsciously but to admit it that's really hard for us to do because we don't want to feel like that much in control which really I, yeah. <laughs> yeah. I, I I would love Nyla just to pass like just I mean also I don't want her to pass at all but I'd love to wake up one day and and she she was passed so I don't have to make that decision but I'm not expecting that to happen I think and I think that's also partly because I think the human tolerance for witnessing death is very small <laughs> like you know you 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 um alluded to it earlier as well about this whole the sort of guilt and relief thing and there is a bit of that in me I mean much though I love Nyla this not really knowing not feeling this is torture for me I, there's a bit of me that would sort of like her to demonstrate that she was ready to go so I could pack her in a box and get her to the vet and stop dithering over it because my I do love her but I love Nyla healthy and boisterous and bristling with energy and not this I don't like seeing I this is all about me I don't like seeing her like this I need constant reassurance it will be a relief for me to get a clear sign from her that she is in some way suffering that that, that Kate goes right 
that's enough time to go. So on the one hand, I desperately don't want that to happen. On the other hand, my human nature of thinking ahead of what, what happens when it, you know, what am I going to, how am I going to, it's sort of like, let's just get this over with so that I can move on with my life. And it, it's awful because there is in there, it's entirely selfish. This is not about Nyla because she's lying in the sun, not eating grapes. <laughs> but On her own, yeah. You know, it, it's, it's, a, it's really holding a mirror up to everything that animals have been building. I, I realise that I realise now. If you remember, we started with the lambs and the pain, and we talked about pain then, and and the realization that so much of what pe people perceive as suffering in animals is a human layer over what is happening. So with the lambs, they were lame. I was like, oh my god, those poor lambs, they can't play. Yes, of course they can play. It's just Kate has taken it to the nth degree that says. A little Jimmy Lamb has a broken leg and he he'll never, you know, and he'll die alone because none of his friends he can't keep up with his friends and he's gonna die a lonely death. And Jimmy's just going, My foot hurts, that's all. Yeah. Like I can live with it. It's humans that associate all this other emotional baggage on top of pain. Yeah. And then they have also taught me that pain, as you said, what is pain? And this is a lot of if you learn to live with long-term pain or What's the word? Long, long term. <laughs> I can't remember the word, but chronic pain. Yeah, you know, about learning to um, distill it into its constituent parts and removing the emotion and just going to the sensation. So if I think about having a sprained ankle, okay, it doesn't make me want to cry. And okay, maybe if I bang my thumb or something and it smarts a bit, that's, but it's different tears. When you have a sore ankle, you rarely need to cry about it. If you take that to, I will never walk again, I can't drive a car, I'm going to lose my car license, everybody will leave me, my friends won't come and visit me, I'm going to live alone for the rest of my life. There's the suffering. It's not about painful ankle. you know. We, and yet when I look at animals, I take that whole package of emotional suffering and plonk it onto the, and the animal's just going, my foot hurts occasionally. <laughs> Nothing. So they take all the emotion out of it. So that's the other thing I've learned. Yeah. So this is really holding a mirror up here mm -hmm. to all the things that I've learned and making me face them head on. Thanks, Nyla. <laughs> She's funny, though. Yeah. She's, I, I've been trying not to cry. We talked about crying <laughs> because hey, I get a headache and, and when will I stop? But like Louise, but the thing is, I have this sort of heaviness. I thought, I thought I heard the cat. She's not supposed to be down here because I've had to bring the hen house in here to paint it because it's so wet outside. <laughs> um, it wasn't her. Who was it? She's locked out because of the paint. Um, got what I was saying now. Hmm. Doesn't matter. Okay. Yeah, I don't know. I don't know either. This one, Nyla. Yeah. Anyway. I was going to say it's a good time to stop. But well, you were talking about crying, but yeah, you were talking about crying, that you could continue, that you could cry about. Well, so that was the other thing. Oh, because there's so much more to this. We'll have to come back to this because um, there is this element as well about when animals are ill, about how much to do for them. Because vets, turns out, are much like doctors. If, they, if there is anything that can be done, they tend to encourage you to do it. And I do understand that they should give you the options. Yeah. But for that, you know, you also need someone that steps back and goes, well, this is like your quality of life. Mm -hmm. You know, do you really want to have your, do you want to be, like, the last option for Nyla was to have a face cut open, to drain the thing, take a sample of whatever it was, send it off for a biopsy and that, then drain her face twice a day. I'm like, are you crazy? Like, I have given her the drugs and done that, none of them did anything, and she told me before we yeah. started that they wouldn't do anything. You know, and now you want me to catch her twice a day and pour water in her face to get to flush out the wound. Are you like mad? Um, and and it's very hard, I think, as a human to not stand up to, but actually, I think it's true of medicine as well. It's like getting chemo in that. It's like you should be looking at the whole quality of life, not just this is possible, this is possible to do, so let's do it. And I think that's a very difficult path for people to navigate and that's something we should talk about as well I think I think so too I you know it's because for you being the ability to ask the animal or ask any being 
what do you want? How can we support you? What would make you feel? And, you know, how are you feeling? All the questions, then you can really provide the care. Medicine, we have to remember, is not an exact science. We've grown accustomed, particularly in our culture, to make it an exact science, that it will cure, it will, cure, it will solve all these things. It's not an exact science. And the whole thing that's coming to light particularly my favorite book of late, The Myth of Normal by Dr. Gabor Mate, is all of the things that have happened energetically, emotionally, mentally, that all impacts the physical, not necessarily the other way around, sometimes the other way around, but really this, and, and if we really understand what do you want, we can provide a whole level of care. I'm watching my favorite show, one of my favorite shows is called The Midwife. Are you familiar with the show? Because it is- I, I am. Only as, only as Miranda being Miranda rather than, oh, I don't think she's in it anymore, is she? Miranda, I don't even know which one that is. She was in the midwife, the original. Oh, okay. Yeah, okay. Um, there's, anyway, sorry. there's so much there. I'm such a fan. Anyways, but the new, for the, in the US, the new season is starting for those of us, it doesn't matter. Anyway, but they're getting to the point of time where in the national health system, and I'm sure in Western culture too, was taking the the birthing process away from the mother and making the decisions for her and not even consulting her. And it's really ticking off the midwives and also the nuns. So there's, there's opportunities, I think, as far as even death goes that we can even do for other human beings that we don't allow and that we can just leave it there because there's a lot yeah. there. Yeah. Well, yeah. We, we, we need to explore that because that's actually a fast, that's a subject all by itself and fascinating yeah. and quite tiring just watched the whole thing on euthanasia i'm not sure i'm any clearer on it but uh, yeah yeah mm -hmm. thank, thank you <laughs> thank you julie thank you nyla <laughs> yes thank you nyla for all yeah. the lessons that you keep teaching me bless her she's a yeah. sweetie yeah so thank you everybody for being here with us yet again for another episode of making light to humans being as you can see we really are trying to be human oh, can be so hard. <laughs> I'm Julie Hirt. With me, as always, is Kate Fago. We try to do these episodes every week, release them on Friday mornings. Um, if you have any questions, comments, concerns, please know that all the animals that we've talked about are all absolutely fine. We do the absolute best to take care of them. We listen to what they have to say, talk, tell the humans what exactly they're saying. We don't interpret, just know that. <laughs> Anyway, if you have any questions, comments, or concerns, please leave it in the chat below. Please subscribe to this so that others can find us. Also, like, rate, review the episodes, again, so that those algorithms can show up for other people. Um, and you can follow us on Facebook, on Instagram. And we really hope to see you here next time. Thank you so much for watching today's episode. See you soon.